if we look at how we are doing molecular equations, what we have to understand is that molecular equations really don't give us a very accurate story of what's going on inside of the, of the substance, inside of the solution. They tell us that compounds are combining and new compounds are forming, but what that really doesn't give us an indication of is what that solution ultimately looks like. What we have to keep reminding ourselves is that when we are looking at substances that are in solution, the water is pulling apart those substances. Not only pulling apart individual molecules from their large crystal, but pulling those individual molecules apart if those molecules are ionic in nature. And so the net result is that a molecular equation is a little bit lacking in specificness. It's a little bit short in specificity. And because of that lack of specificity, it can kind of mi misrepresent what's happening sometimes. So rather than focusing on the molecular equation, when we have substances that are in solution, we're going to focus on the ionic environment. That is the environment inside of that solution itself. And for that, we're going to use ionic equations. The reason we're going to use these ionic equations is because these equations, when done properly, will allow us to know the difference between, hey, something happened here and there's a chemical reaction and nothing happened here. There was no reaction. That's important information to know. Because that could be the difference between us recognizing that a situation is going to actually do something versus recognizing that a situation is going to just yield a whole bunch of ions. So the question is, how do we do this? You know, the previous slide that I showed you showed you um, a molecular equation, an ionic equation, and a net ionic equation. And it really didn't give you any context for how to go from one to the next to the next. So what we are looking for, we, we need that context. We need to know how to do that. And luckily there is a process. And even luckier still, that process involves things that we've already done before. Why did we start this module with the solubility rules? Why did we do assignment 5-1 where I gave you that list of compounds and you put them into all the different buckets? The reason behind that is because to solve an ionic equation, you pretty much have to do the same exact thing. So step one for an ionic equation is you have to have a molecular equation. You have to know what is supposed to be taking place. Step two is you've got to break that down into the individual substances and classify those substances by type. This is exactly what you had to do in assignment 5-1. This substance is a soluble salt. This substance is a strong acid. This substance is a weak base, so on and so on and so on. Steps three and four kind of go together. If a substance is identified as a strong electrolyte, meaning that it's a strong acid, a strong base, or a soluble salt, it's in one of those three categories, we know that it's going to split apart in solution. It's going to break apart into individual ions. If we know a substance to be a weak acid, a weak base, or a non-electrolyte like water or sugar 
or some other kind of molecular compound like carbon dioxide or ammonia, we know that they're going to stay together. So we start with a chemical equation. We classify all the objects. And then we decide to split those objects apart or keep them together based upon how we classified them. That's how you turn a molecular equation into an ionic equation. To turn that ionic equation to what is called a net ionic equation, we have to have some insight into one other kind of substance, the spectator ion. Most of the time, when we run with ionic equations, we're going to see ions that are common on both sides. So this potassium ion is present in the reactants. It's also present in the products. What that should tell us is that potassium doesn't participate in the reaction itself. It's kind of sitting there. Doesn't really do anything. Now, it was important that it was there because I can't bring um, I can't bring chloride to the party if I don't have the potassium ion and potassium chloride to make the solution in the first place. So they're there for a reason, but in terms of the reaction itself, they don't they don't participate and they don't precipitate. They do neither. They just hang around. That's why they're called spectator ions. They just hang around. To go from an ionic equation to a net ionic equation, we remove those spectator ions. And we focus just on the ions that actually participate in the reaction itself. That's why it's called a net ionic equation. This is the net change that is taking place inside of that solution. And this is the really big kicker right here. We know that if an ionic equation only shows spectator ions, then we also know that that reaction didn't actually happen. It is through ionic and net ionic equations that we ultimately can decide and prove that a chemical reaction is taking place in the first place. So just as an example, I could take salt water and combine it with sugar water and nothing is going to happen, right? Put the two together, no precipitation is going to occur, no chemical reaction is going to occur. I now just have a solution that is both salty and sugary instead of the two individually. Similarly, I can take an acid like hydrochloric acid and a base like sodium hydroxide and put them together. And there will be no visible sign of reaction because the products of that reaction are sodium chloride and water. Sodium chloride dissolves. Water is clear and colorless. And it's in an aqueous solution. So we would have no way of knowing that it formed. Two different scenarios, two very similar sets of observations. But a net ionic equation would allow us to prove that the first one, the combining of salt and sugar, didn't actually generate a reaction. But the net ionic equation of the second, the neutralization reaction, 
would prove that something actually did happen. That's how we can tell the difference. That's why this kind of equation writing has a lot of merit to us. It's a proof that something is happening, even if we can't see it visually. Let's take a look at some practice problems. Because really the best way, the only way to get better at this skill is just to do it a lot. And so between today's lecture and the assignment tonight, you're going to do it a lot. Um, and that'll be some pretty good practice leading you up to at some point, we'll do this as a proficiency. Um, and that'll be the last proficiency on our list of 10. So we're getting close. You just took your sixth proficiency this morning. Covalent acid is seven. Solubility rules after break is eight. Redox, which we'll talk about on Wednesday, is nine. And ionic equations is 10. Those are the 10 proficiencies. Like I said, we'll have covered all the content for them by the end of this week. It's just a matter of giving you enough time to kind of process them before I actually give you, you the work to do. So here's our first practice problem. I've got silver nitrate reacting with potassium chloride to make silver chloride and potassium nitrate. First things first, I need to make sure that this equation is balanced. And I can see just from general inspection that it is. I've got one of each kind of ion. No subscripts, no coefficients. Everything's one to one to one to one. So that part's taken care of. Now we need to classify. Silver nitrate. Well, there's no rule on silver, but we do know that nitrates are always soluble. So since nitrates are always soluble, this is a soluble salt. How do I know that potassium chloride is not an acid? Max? There's no hydrogen. Remember, when we're trying to classify, we're looking for hydrogen in the front for acid how do I know it's not a base? Donnie? There's no hydroxide at the end. So if I don't have a hydrogen at the front or a hydroxide at the end, I know I'm not dealing with acid and base. I just need to evaluate the solubility rules. So potassium chloride, I know it's a salt. In fact, I can say all of these are salts because none of them have hydrogen or hydroxide. What's its solubility? Well, potassium, like all of the group one ions, soluble in water. Right, that's like one of the first things we looked for. We looked for potassium compounds, any compound in group one or ammonium compounds, those are always soluble. So. This is soluble. And since I've got potassium on this one, it's soluble as well. Now I've got the chlorides. So we already determined this one. What about silver chloride? What do we know about chlorides? Madison? Okay. This is not soluble. What's the rule on chlorides? You got it in front of you? Go ahead. Okay. So we're talking here about what I've been calling the Merle's exception. Chlorides, any of the halides, fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodide, usually soluble, with the exception of those three, merls, mercury, lead, and silver. 
Well, this one's silver. That's an exception. So this one is insoluble. So now to make my ionic equation, anything that is soluble, I'm splitting apart. So that means the silver and the nitrate, I'm splitting that apart. Silver ion, nitrate ion. One of the most common mistakes made, it's an easy one to fall into. Polyatomic ions stay together. Don't break that apart into nitrogen ions and oxide ions. Doesn't work that way. See this especially when you don't recognize the polyatomic ions. You know, carbonate gets split into carbon ions and, and oxide ions. It's a big mess. Need to recognize those clusters as staying together. So the nitrite ion stays together. Potassium chloride, K plus, Cl minus. Those charges you could have gotten directly from the periodic table because monatomic ions, that's exactly where we get them. Silver chloride is insoluble, so it's a non-electrolyte because it doesn't dissolve in the first place. You have to dissolve in water to conduct electricity. And then potassium nitrate, potassium ions, nitrate ions. So that's my ionic equation. Everything that was soluble got split apart. Everything that was insoluble stayed together. Now we take care of the issue with spectators. Now I should recognize I've got potassium ion on both sides, nitrate ion on both sides. Those will cancel out. And my net equation will be the silver ion reacting with the chloride ion to make silver chloride. All right, any questions so far with this practice problem? All right, again, as we're going through, the, the examples are gonna get a little bit more complex as we go. We run into problems, ask, uh, before we uh, get too far deep. All right. Next practice problem. Very similar in design. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into why here in a second. I've got lead to nitrate. Reacting with sodium iodide. To make sodium nitrate. And lead to iodide. Let's start with solubility. Somebody give me one of the compounds that is soluble in this particular example. All right, go ahead, Max. Okay, sodium iodide. Why is sodium iodide soluble? Right. Sodium is in group one. So since sodium is in group one, group ones are always soluble. So what's the other compound that we can mark as soluble then? Yeah, sodium nitrate. So here in the product. Okay. What do we do with the lead two nitrate? 
Shelby? Okay, you're a little bit ahead. Solubility wise. Okay, it's gonna be soluble. Shelby's already splitting it for us. The only way you'd split it is if it were soluble. Now, why is it soluble? Well, this comes down to rule two. There are certain anions that are always soluble in water. Nitrates, acetates, chlorates, and perchlorates. That's one of them. Nitrates and acetates are the way more common ones. So just like we're looking for sodium ions and potassium ions in our evaluation here, we're also looking for nitrates and acetates in the same kind of way. Dead giveaways that we've got a soluble salt. Okay? The lead to iodide. Well, the lead to iodide is another example of a Merle's exception. Remember, mercury lead and silver l for lead pb is lead and the exception applies to all of the halides not just chloride so iodine bromine fluoride they'd all work so this is insoluble now you might be saying to yourself well hold on this is almost an exact copy of the one we just did and you're right it is in a lot of ways. Why am I highlighting this? Because this particular equation has a couple of things in it that we didn't see in the first example. Namely, what do we do with these subscripts? And what do we do with these coefficients? I haven't had to deal with those yet. Really easy to make mistakes on these. So what do we do? Well, from the ionic perspective, we're going to do exactly what we've done in the last one. Everything that's soluble gets split apart. The mistake comes when I start to do things like this because I just split the lead from the nitrate. We have to remember what that subscript means. That subscript means that there are two of those ions there in that molecule. This is not the name of the molecule itself. This is not the ion. The ion is the nitrite ion, or excuse me, the nitrate ion. Nitrate ion is NO3 negative one. What the, does the two do? The two comes out. Two nitrates. When I have coefficients, it's the same kind of idea, only that two gets distributed over both of the ions in the compound. So I've got two sodium ions and I've got two iodide ions. On the product side, I have two sodium ions and two nitrate ions and since lead to iodide is insoluble it stays together spectator wise i need to recognize i've got two nitrates now and two sodiums so they will all cancel out My net equation, the lead two ion plus two iodides make lead two iodide, PBI2. If you make a mistake with the subscript thing, Putting the subscript and keeping in parentheses on the outside instead of bringing it in front. You're not going to be able to cancel because this 
and the version that I showed you with the parentheses are not the same thing. I can't cancel them out unless they're the same thing. All right, questions with this one. All right, before I ask you to try one, I want to look at one more example problem. Here I've got sodium chloride reacting with barium hydroxide to make sodium hydroxide and barium chloride. Now we need to balance it first, but balancing it should be kind of a trivial matter here. I see I have two hydroxides, so I make two NaOHs. That means I'm gonna need two sodiums, so I need two of those. That gave me two chlorides, which balances out those two chlorides. I'm good. So I've got it balanced. Now I need to evaluate solubility. But one thing I have to remember here, I've got hydroxides this time around. Hydroxides are bases. So I want to evaluate the, the characteristic of the base, not the solubility of the salt. Because that can be really tricky because a lot of hydroxide salts aren't soluble. We want to focus on their basic tendencies, not their solubility tendencies. So sodium compound, we know that dissolves in water. Barium hydroxide, it's a base. Is it a strong base or a weak one? It's a strong one. How do I know that it's strong? It's the first two groups of the periodic table, those hydroxides. The only exception, beryllium and magnesium in that second group. Um, for the second group, we start at calcium instead of beryllium for evaluating strength. If it's not in that first two groups, it's not a strong base. So... Barium hydroxide is below calcium, so it's a strong base. Sodium hydroxide is in group one, so it's a strong base. Barium chloride, remembering our rules for chlorides, does barium fit one of the Merle's exceptions? It's not mercury, it's not lead, it's not silver, it's not an exception, it must be soluble. So from an ionic perspective, everything splits apart here. Two sodiums, two chlorides, a barium ion, two hydroxide ions. The two here distributes, so two sodiums, two hydroxides, the barium ion and two chloride ions. Again, don't confuse the subscript. Just because there's a two on the chlorine doesn't mean that the ion is Cl2. Remember its purpose. Its purpose is there for balance of charge. There are two chloride ions there. Now, all is said and done, the two sodiums cancel out, the two chlorides cancel out, the barium ions cancel out, the two hydroxides cancel out. There's nothing left. So what do we do? Can we say a reaction occurred if nothing changed? That's exactly right. We can't. So we need to say that. We either say no reaction, or we can abbreviate that slightly, or we can abbreviate that a lot. 
all three responses are considered correct. So it is just as possible, it is just as possible to have a reaction like this where nothing happens as it is possible to have an ionic equation that nothing cancels out in. So if I'm starting with stuff on both sides and nothing cancels out because there are no spectator ions, that's perfectly okay. It happens sometimes. Those are kind of the extremes. The one where nothing cancels out and the ionic and net ionic are identical and the one that everything cancels out and we don't have reaction. Most of the time, most examples are somewhere in the middle, like what we saw today. I want to give you one more thing to think about before we call it a day today. Yes, this is a top hat question. We're going to go through it together here, though. If you are asked questions like this, you can obviously go through the whole process of evaluating the total and the net ionic equations and whatnot. But we can also think about this kind of more simply. So if I have copper two nitrate and potassium carbonate, I know they're gonna react in a double replacement fashion. So the potassium and the copper are going to mix or switch rather. That's gonna give me the copper two carbonate, CuCO3 and the potassium nitrate, KNO3. And to balance it, I would just need a two there since I had two potassiums and two nitrates on the reactant side. To answer questions about spectator ions, I really only need to do the second step and just find out what's common between the things that are soluble. So copper two nitrate, will it dissolve? It will. Nitrates always dissolve. Potassium carbonate, will it dissolve? Absolutely. All potassium compounds dissolve. It's in group one. So potassium nitrate, same deal. It's got potassium, which always dissolves. Nitrate, which always dissolves. Copper two carbonate, do we know? It's a carbonate, Madison. It's going to be insoluble. How do we know that? Well, carbonates are almost always insoluble. They're in that last group of things to evaluate. And the uh, only exceptions are the ones that we've been talking about all along. Group one ions, ammonium. Now, what do the things that are soluble on both sides have in common? Potassium and nitrate. Those are the things that are common. Those are the things that were dissolved on both sides, potassiums and nitrates. So when I'm determining the spectator ions, I would take the things that are common. Obviously the copper two and the carbonate are not gonna be spectator ions because they formed the solid here, which means they weren't sitting around watching, they actually made a product. All right, any final questions? I'm sure I'll get some between now and midnight tonight. Feel free to send them at any time. I'll be, I'll be up and around. On your way out, it, um, make sure you get this question answered. Make sure you also get the stoplight question answered as well and have a good afternoon.